Everyone comfortable? At ease? Leaning, leaning back in the moment? If it helps you settle, just gaze around where you are. Just have a sense of the the objects supporting you, your chair, your room, your fans or heaters, whatever the case may be, your window. Check that out with through the eye door, through eye sensitivity, visual experience. And let that visual um, experience be part of the container of silence, of stillness. Uh, now, scan, scan your environment through the ear door, what sounds you hear in the space around you, or inner sounds. Uh, a light body scan. the play, the dance of sensations, that moment to moment form, what we call our bodies, from head to toe. The very simple but profound elements, the elemental nature of textures, earth element, water, fluidity, cohesion, fire element, heat, coolness. Can you feel that? Can you feel any of that in the body, in the hands, the feet, or throughout the whole entire global bodily system with awareness from within the body, not from the head, not through conceptual, uh, assessment or interpretation. And the air element, usually the most predominant when we sit in the, in the form of firmness, like sitting upright, tension, that, that healthy tension of, of being upright. And also movement, vibration, vibrations on many, on many levels, pulsing and oscillation, very subtle, like a purring, like a strobing, shimmering. Whatever the felt experience, that, that is the body. That is what body is. We could start the practice today, if you like, by putting your attention at what is known as the, the inner sensitivity of of chitta, mind, and in this case, mind awareness around the area of the solar plexus or heart. There's a body, a body base and a mental base that comes, that receives thought formations, impressions, memories, or thoughts, most of which are caused yeah, by I can't really. The senses. <sighs> Steve, I'm sorry, you're you're um you're muted again. Someone came in and I had to mute them and I actually muted you. Okay. I'm back. Uh, and you probably still have sensations happening in the body. It means your body is still present. 
we'll also pick it up where um, awareness sinks with those sensations I'm talking about. I suggested beginning awareness right at the heart center, which is considered the physical base of mind. And for many, it's a, uh, like a touchstone, similar to hands, sensitivity of the hands, sensitivity of the feet, or perhaps the sensitivity of uh, your sit bones. In today's meditation, Being aware as as, it, as they appear of these receptors, these inner sensitivities, the six sensitivities. So in addition to the mind base, there's the five physical senses. Those subtle receptors in the ear door in the eye door that receive sound vibrations, light waves, and the sensitivity of nose and tongue, and the body that is continually receiving the elemental imprints in the immediacy of contact between the, the imprints of the elements in the body, sound vibration, light, and the other qualities. Consciousness arises, knowing arises. It's how we know body, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting. Often we pay attention more to the external object uh, of sight or sound. Here I'm just suggesting attunement or syncing this pre-verbal awareness to the receptors at times to understand that the great sensitivity, vulnerability, openness of the body and the senses. And, and how all that we have, which is this body, with consciousness, with knowing, and the extension of body through seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touch. It's all that we have that, in order to experience the universe. And it's all that we need. It's the very place where understanding these sensitivities and the impressions that come from sound, light, elements is life. That contact of the impressions and the receptivity is our life of sight and sound and scent and taste and touch, thought formations, emotive movement, a great creative emotions and the painful, difficult emotions and the smooth, even, equanimous emotions. So it's all right here. But sometimes mindful, wise reflective reflections, wise consideration is useful in keeping us, bringing us back from being in our story, our narrative. But most of the time, we don't need anything. It's just that sense of settling back, turning the, our awareness senses inwardly. And for the time of the meditation, reminding ourselves there's no need to go anywhere to remember, reflect, or anticipate. The 
the whole f the whole profundity and poignancy of practice comes out of this ability to anchor here and now in this body which is only happening in this moment the sensations in the body are always happening only now not a moment ago and not in the future what we can feel is here, here and now see if that's not true for yourself nothing to assess nothing to embellish it's the mind's nature to think thoughts so if we go to the mind base and are aware of thinking as a process and not as a story that we identify and get pulled into then we're becoming keenly connected to we're sinking awareness with thinking process the thinking is real the concepts the story is not real it's not felt experienced in the moment if you're drawn to your home anchor the body sitting for some it's sitting and a touch point like sitting and the sit bones or sitting in the hands touching sitting touching sitting touching for some it's the variation of the elemental play in breathing meaning when we breathe in that the abdominal wall expands pushes out increases in pressure fills and and peaks at a certain point of tension and pressure and there's no controlling forcing just as naturally with the out breath the abdominal wall starts to collapse soften lighten the feeling of falling lightning decreasing pressure subtle sensation vibration oscillation then there's that pause often a gap long enough to connect with your touch point your hands or your body So, so sinking with the movement of those sensations it doesn't matter if your focus is is refined into a microscopic mindful investigation of those sensations within the abdomen and rising falling or whether it's like a it's broader global a wide angle lens where you feel the entirety of the the abdomen in its movement up and out and in and down there's no preferred style wisdom usually chooses if we're quiet you may notice with the sequential moments of awareness synchronizing with the movement and changing sensations of the abdomen rising falling or the body as it's felt in the moment that after some period there's a settling 
an inner settling, a, a softening of the senses, the sensations, the thought formations, busyness perhaps becomes more white noise in the background. And kind of like a hibernating bear or a resting, purring cat. We, we get a sense of this, these profound moments of what we can call deep rest. Deep rest where there's a re- refreshing, a f- refreshing energy arising rather than an anticipation forward or a reflection backward. It happens by itself, not by trying. Skilled effort is simply momentary. Just the moment that awareness lands on the changing sensations of the rising abdomen or sensation in the upper back a sound being received at the ear door, a momentary memory being received at the mind base,
in the last part of our meditation. If you'd like to return your awareness and anchor it around the heart area, heart center. And call up the quality, that sensitive, profound emotion. Uh, it's called uh, metta, friendliness, true connection, unconditional kindness, pure love, as Sayada Upandita like to call it. And can you just feel it circulate there around the area of the heart center? If you wish, you can put your hand there and feel the warmth and friendly contact, touch sensation. The shifting to this metta becomes a metta awareness. Remain right here at the heart center if you wish, or just see if it flows out into the rest of the body, up through the neck into the head. and down our backs, down our shoulders and arms and fingers and the front of the body. So that the awareness, the meta-awareness as it touches the felt sense sensation immediately embraces it with that friendliness kind connection, receptivity, holding. And down into the hips and pelvis. Upper legs and lower legs. Into the feet and toes. the felt sensation, experience, embraced with this meta-awareness, kindness. And then with, without feeling any force of thought or energy, that pushes out away from our body, the, the sense of extension to the web of life everywhere. Alternatively, allowing the web of life everywhere, everywhere to enter into our body, feeling no separation intricate part, necessary part of this web of life that includes all sentient beings, all habitats, all oceans, mountains, sky, clouds, the smallest and the largest of creatures and material formations. It's no different than our bodies, therefore it makes it easy to stay in our body. As we extend outward throughout the whole planet, feeling it as this spinning blue, green, and white jewel in the vastness of space, in all its majesty, fragility.
extending then as far out into the universe. as possible in this moment to the edge and beyond of what is known. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> I'll just keep, keep ringing the bell. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I wish we were all together in person rather than our little, it's like a little quilt of, um, seeing you, which is lovely. So hello, everybody. Welcome. Today, um, in some ways, it feels so fast, uh, the time. And um, I, I just wanted to touch base on a few things very lightly today. It's, a, it's basically a wisdom and love talk. And um, remembering that navigating through our human life, um, one of the ways we navigate spiritually is, is really this deep question that hopefully we never feel like we have a um, solid answer to, but the question of who am I and who are you? Whether we're asking who are you to a cloud or who am I to a thought or an emotion or who just just anything that appears moment by moment um, this this kind of basic inquiry as to what is reality is how we navigate and often uh, how we try to describe a moment of attention that is um, truly able to inquire. It requires a, an ability to really um, put aside our past ideas of how things are, our past knowledge, because, you know, and this is what's so fundamental, again, it's that each moment is new. So this, this wisdom side of our spiritual navigation um, tends to lead us toward this uh, understanding on deeper and deeper levels of how things are changing. You know, that, that, that each moment is new. Each moment appears and disappears. Each thought appears, disappears. Each emotion will take a form, sometimes like a very fast cloud, a little whisper of clouds, sometimes it's a big thunder cloud, uh, but it, it will arise and pass. So this belief in that we can control our thoughts, our body, our emotions, and that others can, this is significant, this question, who am I or who are you? This is a, it's meant to be a very deep inquiry into how things are. So often, I think in our busy daily lives, it sometimes is helpful to be reminded of just really basic things like, you know, whether we're um, walking to the bathroom or, you know, sitting down on our cushion or whatever, that often the beginning part of a moment of clear attention is remembering. It's just remembering what I'm saying. Remembering that each moment is new. Remembering that it's helpful to put aside our past ideas of things because the exploration into how things are has to come out of the present. 
it, it's not coming out of what is past known. It's the venture. The adventure is always into the unknown because that's the truth. The truth is that each moment is new. So that remembrance is so fundamental. And it can seem really like, well, is that... Um, Oh, I learned that 20 years ago or five years ago. But it, it, this is just the basic, you know, simplicity of the practice is, again, that venturing spirit into the unknown moment by moment. And this is how we learn. This is the, this is the thing that's so um, missing in our training, whether we're uh, five years old or 10 or 80, is the sense that we're here to learn. We're here to learn, and, and the exploration, again, comes through. The spiritual exploration is coming through um, letting go of the known. When I did a um, three-month retreat in 1984 with Sayada Upandita, uh, there was plenty of time to attempt to understand what sati or mindfulness is. And I put together uh, a, a word, R-A-I-N, RAIN, for um, the aspects of mindfulness that I felt were the most important in terms of understanding how this um, inquiry this exploration happens. So I'm not going to go into it deeply, but this is just like these, again, these gentle reminders of, of how to um, explore in the present moment. Well, it requires the ability to remember to be here and then to receive. So often if I'm feeling disconnected, if, if you're feeling disconnected in any way, check to see if you're remembering to be here in the present. It's that, it's that, it's that much, you're, uh, the beautiful uh, translation of sati is recollecting the attention. You recollect it. And as Steve said, that there's that, those moments when you start to feel like you're settling in. And you can feel, you could feel the whole group was settling in. It's just this exquisite sense of landing. And we land inside um, our body. We land inside uh, how things are in the present moment, not what we remember five minutes ago or 10 minutes ago or 10 years ago. And then say we are anchoring the attention with a breath, we've recollected the attention and we try to connect the attention with something, very simple again. But are we thinking about the breath? Are we thinking about the sound? It's so easy. If you, The longer you've meditated, the longer you've practiced, the easier it is to bring the attention to the breath and like go, well, you know, I certainly think I know what that is. I, you know, right? It's like just whatever. It's like if you've paid attention to anger a number of times, then you'll tend to get complacent. I have, I have to tell you that I am not good at computers. I'm not good at getting on Zoom, you know, and I've done it now for a 10-day retreat, a five-day retreat, and I got complacent. I, I, it's like, oh, you know, five or two, no, no problem, and it was a problem, you know, I couldn't remember any of it. It's just like, it's not my uh, thing, right? So it was just, this, it's the same thing with anything. We can think, um, oh, I know this, and yet that that thinking we know is the biggest obstacle it, to just ah oh, that just landing and not knowing not it's like right now i have bare feet my feet are touching the floor can i bring my attention there and just really try to receive the sensations that are there not my visual image of foot and wow, I can tell you that remembering that is hard for us. The busier we get, the more we read the news, the more we're doing, 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 then the less we're going to remember how to not only connect rather than being disconnected, but rather to, con to connect with something that's actually happening in the moment and then not get caught in the past concepts of the word foot. Right. This is really um, again. You might 
or I might tell myself this hundreds of times, but actually doing it, walking to get a glass of water, you know, where, where a lot of us are practicing at home. And it's, it, these are the walking out to look at a, a plant. We might see that plant hundreds of times, but do we see it? Do we see tree? Do we see the word tree? Or do we see that alive being of tree that is changing moment by moment? This is the challenge, right? This is the, uh, ah, the beauty of being alive. If we were dead, we wouldn't be noticing change. So this emphasis on this kind of exquisite receiving, and then when we talk about the breath, well, the breath is usually for most people very subtle and refined. Uh, and it, the idea of it, it is that it's more neutral. So the idea of an anchor is to bring the attention to something not intense because when we're busy in life, we tend to get addicted to it, intensity. And our whole sense of identity comes from intensity, whether it's painful or pleasant. It's like it, it hooks us more than just remembering to come back to something less intense, more refined, more subtle. Uh, this is, again, the challenge of a daily life practice, an on-the-cushion, off-the-cushion practice, is, again, remembering that more neutral um, objects of attention actually calls us out. It calms the attention. We can maybe come to more stillness. <laughs> uh, I like to listen to, last night, there was uh, rain. I live in the desert, and the sound of the rain on the roof is just, it's not that intense, right? But there's something so um, calming and liberating and just like letting everything go. I can be busy, but wow, you know, getting to hear the rain in the desert, even though it's incredibly quiet, is a gift. So the R in RAIN, the word RAIN, the, an acronym, the acronym, um, the R, I've mentioned so many aspects of the R already, right? Remem recollecting the attention, remembering t to be here, receiving the sensations just as they are. Maybe it's a few minutes of textures, vibrations. I notice when I brought my attention to my feet. What is it? Coolness, hardness, aliveness. And ultimately, there's a kind of wordless aliveness that I would call my foot, right? And is it my foot? Then it's, I'll get that, I'll to the, get that <laughs> to that in a minute. But okay, so, ah. Oh. And I didn't even get to my, the R I came up with in 84. Look, it's 2020. I can talk about the R forever without even getting to where I was in 84. That's a long time ago. The R is recognizing. And it's so fun. Like, to me, this is so fun because it's like we can sit for 10 minutes and not recognize ha, 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 that we're sitting. Just knowing we're sitting because we'll be caught up in so many thoughts, right? And then to be able to bring the attention to just being aware of knowing we're sitting can feel like a miracle. Knowing we're sitting, recognizing, recognizing when we're walking, maybe we go for a walk, recognizing that hearing is happening, recognizing that stepping is happening. You know, we tend to like things more complicated. Again, there's that hook into complicated rather than simple, knowing that we're sad versus not knowing. It's this, this is the aspects of mindfulness that we can tend to um, want something else other than how things are. And then the A is acceptance. Oh, and I'm just touching in lightly to this because when you feel yourself settling in, there's often a, often a shift from resisting a subtle resistance to 
remembering to be here and being here in this different way, in this more shifting to more timeless than caught up in stress and time, shifting to more timeless. And it's um, that comes through accepting how things are, accepting that what we think of as my foot or my head or my knee pain is is really these constant changing physical sensations of hard, soft, warm, cool. It's shifting into reality. Who am I? Well, the question, who are you, who am I? We'll say, explore it, but not from five years ago or a minute ago, but explore what's happening in the aliveness of my body right now without the visual images. And this exploration is not just for you, but it's like if you have um, any being in your house, a gecko, a cat, a dog, uh, a bird outside, they, th what is their body? Well, it's a transforming process of earth, air, fire, and water. The more you understand how your body is, the more you'll understand bodies free from the visual image of cat or free from the visual image of tree or free from the visual image of anything. And then of course, when we start to get quiet and, and why it's hard sometimes to just keep getting more silent and quiet is the sense that, oh, maybe we f feel some grief. Maybe there's some... <laughs> Maybe there's hearing, right? It's just a flow of life happening, right? So accepting that hearing was just happening. It's just hearing. Maybe aversion appears or attachment. What were they saying, right? It's like you just, you just go with the process of how things are rather than maybe we felt like the sound shouldn't happen. That's resistance. But if we felt the sound shouldn't happen and we're with that flow, you just, you're with that flow, there's no problem. So you see this, this flow that happens and you include, you include the resistance. Or say with rec the R with recognition, if thinking's happening and we space out, you don't go that's wrong or bad. It's like you include it as just part of life. Recognition, spacing out, acceptance, resistance. It's all just, you just start noticing, 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 seeing it as part of who am I, who are you, who are we. And then the I interest, oh, we all know when it shifts from being bored or oblivious and sort of on automatic pilot or rote to, to that shift, you know, I can say all these things, but I can maybe walk by a plant that I've planted outside my house in a little pot, right? And I can walk by, but how many times am I interested? And so the, this again, the, I'm saying these things today as reminders that, well, how does interest come about? You can't make it happen, but certainly it's always good to remember what a little little kid is like or a little animal is like or you know it's just like um, a lot of baby birds were born recently around my house they're ground birds they're called franklins <laughs> little birds they're so they're so interested in everything right and the adults are sort of you know trying to walk around protect them but it's like that quality again of interest usually requires energy so if we're using up a lot of our energy, and we don't make enough time for this spiritual exploration, we're going to miss life. But we'll miss the interest in, in the aliveness of life itself, in the exploration itself. So um, again, I could talk about these things much, but to be interested in anger free of any past ideas about it or to be interested. I have um, roosters outside my house and dogs and they make a lot of um, so-called sound, right? But how many times?
do I just hear it without the word rooster or dog? Just vibration, textures coming and going. Life revealing itself moment by moment. And I, I just want to remind us all that we emphasize being with our bodies and being with sounds and, and having that um, connection because it's much harder to do this with thought. It's much harder to do what I'm saying. To be interested in thought without getting lost in the content is super hard. To be interested in <laughs> thought, I mean, it comes along and it's so fast if you wanted to check it out, it's already gone. It's like really um, hard to do, explore thought free from any past ideas um, or to explore happiness or joy or sadness or um, fear. So the, the, that we, we encourage this practice of slowing down a bit, you know, daily practice, of course, every day to get quiet enough to remember how to explore, how to become, how to see clearly, so that we're not just reacting to all these past ideas about things but really respond, learning how to respond well and just to discern well what's happening. <clears throat> and the N, um, it, this also, all these letters have gone through so many changes. Again, I say it's 2020, but I came up in, initially in 84 with non-identification. Um, and it requires explaining identification. Identification is when we think something is my thought or my, my anger or my grief or my happiness or my pleasure. Or, um, my body getting old. So that this, remember that when I say my, that we also say you, your thoughts, your anger, your, your body, right? Your, um, or we say we, our bodies. But it's like when you, the idea is that we start to investigate, how could they possibly be mine? If my body was mine, I would never let it get old. If my thoughts were mine, I would never think these thoughts. You know, really, it's like when you get quiet, usually the first obstacle is aversion to the thoughts because you can't control them and we're believing them and believing them. And it's like, it's so oppressive because we have no space. We have no ability to see them clearly. And we can't, we can't even imagine that our body isn't ours. We can't even imagine that your body isn't yours or your thoughts aren't yours or your emotions aren't yours because we're so lost in it all and it's happening. We don't understand a permanence. We don't understand how fast it's going. But that there's a great teacher named Sri Nizargadatta Maharaj from India that's no longer alive, but he calls it being infected, being infected by I am the body idea or being infected by I am my mind idea, or being infected by I am my emotions idea. He called it an infection. So again, taking the time to explore in the, int in the interest of compassion, in the interest and compassion for us all to really find out on deeper and deeper levels, what it is that's happening and why are we reacting so much to this? Sometimes I reread uh, Serena Zargadatta, all I do, I just open the book and look at a sentence. And um, last night I looked and I read this thing where um, someone asked him if he was afraid of getting old and dying. And he's, he said, um, a wise person is happier the older they get because they're getting they're getting closer to being home they're just gonna you know when they die a wise being just goes home it 
isn't that a great, wouldn't that be great? You know, any of the wise beings, the really truly free beings, even when they die, you go into where they lived and the vibe, the vibe is of such peace, of such joy, and their body isn't there. What is that, right? Like, I'm not telling you to believe me. I'm asking you to explore. So the N, non-identification, you could say the opposite of it is a possessiveness. It's an it's a incredible self-centeredness. So when Steve leads the sitting so that we start and center ourselves and opens that up to caring about every being in the universe, that's the opposite of self-centeredness, right? But it's based on wisdom. So wisdom and love come together. It's that sense of really understanding relationship. So the N, the non-identification, shifts us to a real deep sense of non-possessiveness and less self-centeredness. So if you understand how to have a relationship of love and peace with the appearance of aversion, it doesn't matter if it's inside or outside you. You'll go, oh, I know how to be with this. Or, or fear or joy. It's like, it's, it, of course it starts with the personal. It, becomes, it goes from my knee to earth, air, air and fire and water coming and going by itself. It goes from my happiness to a, th a thought and maybe some gratitude and it shifts. It's, it's you, you get that you might start with it mine, but then if you look at it and observe it and care about it, it it's no longer yours. And you see it doesn't last anyway. How could it be yours if it doesn't last? There was a, a great Japanese hermit monk, poet. His name was Saigyo. He lived from 1118 to 1190. And I've mentioned him in the last month in a few of my talks. Um, when you look at the... Um, poems in the book, the word tomo, the Japanese word tomo appears a lot in his poems, and it means friend, and he uses that word tomo for clouds or insects or emotions like loneliness. It's really been, he's really taught me a lot about relationship of friendship with all, all that appears. So even if you said that the natural um, spiritual journey will be to open to more and more inclusion rather than less and less inc inclusion, you start to see that you can include, when you understand inquiry, you start to include every thought, every emotion, every body sensation but not just yours, every, every being's. It's like you, because you have the skill, you have the strength to see it clearly. So he said, he often introduces a poem with a little um, saying, you know, a little something of what has been happening. He said, at a point in time when I was feeling desolate, I heard the voice of a cricket very close to my pillow. It's summer. Most of us hear crickets now. At a point in time when I was feeling desolate, I heard the voice of a cricket very close to my pillow. So this is the poem. At that turning point, with my head for the last time pillowed in sagebrush, 
I would have this chirping insect still be what's closest to me. Even right before his death, this cricket is such a friend. He wants this cricket there with him. That's what we're talking about in the spiritual journey, is getting that. You might have this idea that you don't want to die feeling lonely. But you see, Sega would say, he's such good friends with loneliness, it wouldn't be a problem. Or maybe there's pain in the hip, but he's learned to make that a relationship of wisdom and love so that you see you're, you're learning to live and die every moment live and die every moment and start it's not just a um, as you can see i'm not saying uh it's a casual acquaintance this is something that is a deep committed friendship your thoughts, your emotions, your body, others' thoughts, others' um, emotions, but they're not personal. It's not me or mine or I. It's life revealing itself moment by moment. It's the aliveness that we have a relationship with. And of course, he lived um, very... Um, Quietly, he was a hermit monk. But I love Saigil because of his genuine emotional op candor. So you hear how many years he suffered. It, they said he suffered from loneliness, like an illness, a deep illness. Hoped for, looked for guests just never made it to my mountain hut. So you feel all that hope, all, all that suffering, hoped for, looked for guests, just never made it to my hut. The now congenial loneliness I would hate to live without. The now congenial loneliness I'd hate to live without. That's what Tomo is. And that's what the meditation practice is. It's relationship, not getting rid of anything, but getting a healthier and healthier spiritual relationship. That's the strength, is um, in the wisdom and the love, not in what's appearing. I was going to add in the Brahma Viharas, <laughs> but I'm not sure if we have time. Um, the love part of the spiritual exploration, uh, the Buddha had an incredible map in his um, descriptions and teachings on the four Brahma Viharas. And that's Brahma, Vihara. Vihara is abode or home. Brahma is divine home. But it's, it's like a, a, a way of being that you include what isn't the Brahma, Vihara. Um, and I, I just want to give one example. I can't do all four. But say we start with loving kindness. The Buddha taught the Brahma Vihara of loving kindness, of compassion, of empathetic joy and equanimity. So the loving kindness he taught that the experience that seems so much like it but isn't is romantic love or attached love. So he's not saying that's wrong or bad. He's saying that, that it isn't metta. So loving kindness, as he taught it, the, the Brahma Vihara, is love, our definition of love, infused with wisdom. So it's like it's a love infused by, with wisdom. So that, that's what distinguishes it from when we use the word love, we could be 
say we could be meaning many different things, right? But, but what the Buddha was teaching was this particular kind of love, the Brahma Vihara, um, which takes, again, years of exploring to understand. He said it was very hard to practice it and to, um, it's like uh, Martin Luther King, he said, our strength is love, our strength is love. But what did he mean by love, right? And what do I mean by love when I say love? It's like the, that word is so important. And we, we need metta so, um, so much right now. We need this kindness like we need air, like we need water. And what, what does it feel like? So, Steve was emphasizing, what is the felt sense of metta? Well, the felt sense, the Buddha said, was like when a mother cow gives birth to a baby calf and the, the, the mother cow and the baby calf, at that moment they have eye contact, that that's metta. Okay, so I'm emphasizing the word relationship. There's the relationship, right? And what, what do any of us, it doesn't have to be a mother cow, if we see a newborn, if we brought a newborn into this room, this Dhamma hall, if we have a picture now of a newborn, most of us would feel like really want wishing that being well, right? We would just wish that being well. Well, the Buddha said that we need to learn how to feel that for ourselves, for our thoughts, for our body, for our emotions. And he said to start with ourselves and that the, the potential is that we, we have this relationship of, of kindness for all beings, that we wish well all beings, just like a newborn, that that's the practice. And we can see that <laughs> we're not always perfect at that, right? It's, so the, the, I will... Um, We'll take questions now, but um, I'll end with a quote. And I just want to say that uh, we are, Jesse, Steve, and I are cheering you on. We know that it can be uh, a wild ride these days. And uh, the, the reason I chose what to talk with about today or Steve with the guidance today, it's, more, it's just that kind of reminders of what we're doing on, on the steep level of exploration. So I'm ending with um, Sri Nisargadatta Maharaj. All you need is already within you. Only you must, only you must approach yourself with reverence and love. Self-condemnation and self-distrust are grievous errors. Your constant flight from pain and search for pleasure is a sign of love you bear for yourself. All I plead with you is this. Make love of yourself perfect. Deny yourself nothing. Give yourself infinity and eternity and discover that you do not need them. You are beyond. We must approach ourselves, but all beings, right? We must approach ourselves with reverence and love. So there's time for some questions. I'm hoping Jesse will come on somewhere. I, uh, my computer isn't showing him. Um, and uh, Steve or Jesse and I can answer any question. And uh, thanks for listening. So yeah, we have um, a little bit of time for uh, questions. <clears throat> I think I'll just say, you know, there's really the invitation is 
um, for questions about uh, I'll talk, about Steve's instruction, about things that you might be curious about in terms of your meditation practice, um, but not really comments. This is like a time, we don't have that much time, so just to, to make use of, of it for the sake of your practice. And um, you can go into the, you know, the right hand side of your screen to click on the button that says raise hand if you want to raise your hand to ask a question. I have a question. Yeah, I'm sorry, I can't see who this is. Todd, I, there's no raise hand button, so I tried a reaction, but ah. not raising the actual hand in real life. Hi, Todd. What's your question? Um, I just had a question about um, the last few weeks, there's been um, holding a lot of, um, it's like tightness in the chest and the throat, and it comes with thought products. It seems like that the sensation is attached to the thought products, but that can't be right because the thoughts are not mine. So my question is, how do you open up? Just how do you open up when your body is filled with the anxiety and the fear without trying to investigate it through the thoughts? Good question. Jesse, do you want to go for it? I can, I can start. We can go between us. Um, I think the, on the, you know, the most sort of like basic level of this practice is just that sort of deep deepening inquiry into whatever assumptions we have. I mean, we can say we are not our thoughts or we can say we're not our body as kind of like basic Dharma, but to whatever degree that is the experience we're having or not is like totally a different question. And so the notion that that's true doesn't really matter. Like the, the reality is, is that most of the time we pretty much feel like our thoughts are our thoughts. And, and most of the time we pretty much feel like our body is our body. And, and this practice isn't about trying to convince ourselves otherwise or trying to just sort of like um, oppress a certain view. Uh, it really is about like, wow, that's so fascinating there is an inkling that there's a, there's a thought process, or as you say, thought product uh, related to some physical sensations. And then you allude to, you know, anxiety or sort of emotional pieces. And so, you know, there is an inkling that these things are related. And the practice of Vipassana is always going to, to be the, the suggestion of like a deeper inquiry into that. Not, in, not intellectually, as you're saying, but of like, well, what is the relationship actually between the mind and the body? What is the relationship between just the thinking mind and the emotional qualities of mind, right? This, this thing we call mind, we translate as chitta, the Pali word chitta. Sometimes we'll say mind, we'll say heart. The idea is really it's it, everything that is not physicality is encompassed in that. So that it's knowing, it's emotion, it's, it's thoughts, it's consciousness, it's, um, it's pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, feeling tone that arises with any sensation. So what is mind is like this huge spectrum to be explored. And then what is the relationship between mind and body? Where does the physical contraction perhaps take place in response to an emotion? What is the emotions response in relationship to the mind, uh, the, the thoughts that are happening? Um, you know, the way that these three things that you're naming are intertwined is it's a, a incredibly subtle and incredibly important. And, and the practice is always gonna be check, look more closely, you know, don't just sort of fall back on the sort of frameworks that we have, which can be very helpful, but to really just explore, right? And when it feels like me, to acknowledge that. It'd be like, this really, I feel angry. And that feels, and the me feels really strong in that. And it's like, okay, well, what is that sense of me? Or I, you know, what is this emotion? And can we feel the motion without the physical experiences? Like, is there a way to actually feel mind outside of body? 
some that's often very hard and so we and and we will look towards the physical correlation of of like oh well i notice this tightness in my chest and that usually is a sign of some kind of unease in the mind in the mind and the in the heart and sort of that deepening exploration so there's the exploration part of just genuine interest you know of like oh looking then I think the other part that Michelle brought up and Steve brought up of like, what is the relationship of, of loving kindness, of, of creating a little bit of tenderness? Because sometimes if we're really tightly wound in an emotion, tightly really kind of locked into a pattern of, of thoughts and emotions and physical kind of contraction, it can be very hard to investigate without like an agenda, right? Because we're investigating because we want to get rid of it or we're investigating because we think it's wrong or whatever or we want to figure it out versus like investigation just out of pure genuine interest. And so actually the tenderness of heart, the loving kindness is something we can bring in as just like a sort of soothing quality as like a salve, you know, to the heart, to the mind, or just like this, the softening. And sometimes it, it really can be very important to, to bring in whether it's the meta flavor or the compassion flavor or the joy flavor of it um, or the equanimity flavor. Um, as a way of sort of like kind of settling the system down so it feels safe to explore. Because often we won't feel safe to explore if, we feel, if the mind or the body knows that there's a lot of like judgment there. There's a lot of agenda. There's a lot of like trying to get rid of something. And so it's like the, the Brahma Viharas create that kind of context of like of a safe engagement between the investigative qualities of the mind and, and whatever is arising more naturally. Um, I don't know if the two of you have more to say, but, or if Todd, if you have more sort of like kind of subtlety in terms of if that made sense or where you want to go with the questions. And we'd have to unmute you again. There you go. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. The, yeah, the loving kindness to sort of like calm things down so you can try to take them apart certainly is helpful. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting, I mean, Michelle quotes Sri Nizar Gadada a lot, and it's interesting because he's from a really different tradition, really. He's not a Buddhist, you know, it's, um, and so his method is in a lot of ways kind of different than our method in terms of practice, but it's interesting. In, in a lot of his method, the name of this book is I Am That, and it's like exploring this I am, right? And that can be a whole approach to practice, even in Vipassana, just like, looking into identification like where does this sense of me really come from uh where is it rooted and maybe not so much where but when is it you know sometimes we start to notice that the sense of me only really arises when there's a lot of aversion or a lot of um, um attachment or certain kinds of delusion right because it really is an element of delusion but in more neutral experiences and the more sort of subtle sometimes that sense of me just doesn't arise and um or just not as strongly and so i think that there's there's that exploration of just like where am i in all of this who is the me where is that sense of like meanness happening and 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 where in the process is it taking place is a great place to explore too yeah I have one other thing I could add to that. Okay. Am I on? Yeah, you're on. Okay. Um, I think just um, if anxiety is something difficult for you, some people, you know, anxiety isn't that hard to uh, have a connection to. So it's sort of also knowing yourself and knowing if um, anxiety is something that you can kind of settle in with or if you resist it because it's the resistance that's so painful and um it, it's like taking a little anxiety bath <laughs> you might kind of explore it for a few seconds but if it's difficult for you then really go somewhere else with your attention that's why we teach anchors because even if the chest is tight or the thoughts are intense we're teaching to to develop over time something else to keep your attention with even if it doesn't last it might be that you go to the breath or a sound for two seconds and the tightness in the chest comes but you have that two seconds 
and you keep going back to those two seconds and back to those two seconds. Or if I have a lot of anxiety, I go for a walk. I try to outrun it. <laughs> you can't really outrun it, but it's like often with anxiety, there's a lot of energy and restlessness and you just kind of walk until you can accept the anxiety. It's, so much of this is if you're resisting it, respect it. If you're accepting it, take a bath and learn from it. I'll, I'll add one thing too. In the last few months, I feel a lot of compression here and a lot of different emotions. Uh, what I find really helpful is to open up body awareness and feel my entire body, but not focus here. So it's like my every other part of the body is just holding this space almost like cradling, cuddling, holding the space here until there's a calm. Remember when I was doing the guided meditation, I was saying try to notice if the, the sequential stream of silent awareness or the seamless moments of awareness, you might begin to feel a, a bodily calming and a mental formation calming. <clears throat> Every time we notice that, it, it feeds that calming stream. Whenever we notice uh, peacefulness, it increases the peacefulness. So I try to feel the whole body relaxing. And it just holds this area. And I just wait and see what happens. And, and, and quite often, there's, there's just a sense of acceptance or, or, or um, integration. Uh, and I let go of needing to know what it is exactly. I let go of trying to interpret, analyze. I just take it for what it is, pressure, compression, tightness, tension, and then back off again into the whole body. And then when it feels, I feel a comfort zone, a safety, then I see if it can be integrated, not fixed or not solved, but just part of what's happening right now. And that's, been a, a lot of the experience since I came back to Hawaii three months ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll just add too that, you know, there are times where there are, you know, mental impulses that are uncomfortable that are, you know, there's information there that it might be helpful to do something, right? Like that, that, Maybe there's whatever the content is, you know, maybe, maybe there is an impulse of feeling of, of emotion that is information of to take some kind of action, right, in, in a relationship or with in the world or in your job or whatever the sort of content might be that feels like is causing this, your, your system is sort of like entangled with, um, you know, there is that sense of like, okay, well, there, there's, a, there's a calling there, right, to, to do something, to act. And I think that from, again, from this standpoint, the question is always going to be, what's the motivation? And then, like, do we take care to act not out of the anxiety, not out of just because we're trying to not feel what we're feeling, but because there's information there that we're taking seriously, right? We're taking responsibility for something uh, in order to act. And yet, the, in that action, there's like a whole new range of kind of questions and, and possibilities and skills that we develop in terms of the practice around, like, okay, we have a discomfort, and how, what are our habitual ways of relieving ourselves from that? Do we try to make someone else uncomfortable because it, it, it projects it onto someone else? Do we just get angry? Do we get frustrated? You know, to what degree are we doing that because we don't want to feel what we're feeling? To what degree are we going and doing something, you know, in the world, in our relationships that might be reckless, that might be really motivated again by not wanting to feel this thing versus out of maybe true compassion or true kindness or true whatever helpfulness and so again it's always this sort of dance of like no matter what even if there is the impulse to go do something about what's happening all of what's been offered is still relevant right there still has to be the sense of we're taking responsibility for our discomfort with dis-ease we're taking responsibility for the mind's anxiousness for the ways that it plays out in the body 
And then in that, the idea is that we then have more capacity to, you know, feel care for ourselves, feel care for the anxiety, for, you know, attend to all of these things internally and grow, and also to not be coming out of that place when we do, you know, act in the world beyond ourselves. Thank you. Mm. All of you. <laughs> I keep going. <laughs> Anybody else? 111 people? Question somewhere? I have an ant on my glasses. Uh, uh, Mandy, are you there? Yeah. Oh, did you? Un yeah, you unmuted. Okay. Um, so this question actually pertains to one of Michelle's talks during the 10 day retreat. Um, so I'm hoping I can remember this properly, but Michelle, um, in one of your talks, you said something in passing, and I was hoping maybe you could elaborate. So um, you said something to the effect of that you came to realize that self-hatred or self-blame was actually a form of protection. Um, I hope I'm paraphrasing you correctly because it's been a while, but it sort of stuck with me and I was hoping maybe you could talk a little bit about that if you remember saying that. Um, I, I do remember saying that. Um, Thank you. I'm just trying to figure out where to go with it. I think that um, We have to remember that we're born into this world of pleasure and pain. It's a given. And that we each have a unique karma in history to how we develop a defense system to be with that range of pleasure and pain because you don't come in understanding it right away. And um, so for some people, this is a very fast version of the answer. Um, some people develop uh, a preemptive strike. <laughs> Self-hatred is like a preemptive strike. It, it, it's like rather than feeling vulnerable and that you never know what's going to happen, meaning that maybe everybody in your town is going to hate you for whatever. I mean, uh, that's a, but you know, really that, that the self-hatred is usually something that you bring in to blame yourself to feel like it's your fault. Um, it's a protection against not knowing what's going to happen next. Even protecting you from your own self-hatred, right? It's like a, I always think of when that pattern is coming through for myself uh, that I usually go, oh, this is my protection. And rather than hate that, right, you know, that the reason it's good to think of whatever is difficult that we have as a, a protection, it's a, it's a protection that gradually gets replaced by mindfulness. It gradually gets replaced by metta. It, you gradually replace it by being okay with being vulnerable. You replace it with the wisdom to know that you can't control what's going to happen next. But the strength is in the um, connection with the vulnerability. But if you're caught in a self-hatred attack, I think of it as an attack against yourself, to remind oneself that all it is, is a learned, you learn it, you learn this way of protecting yourself, then you see if you can care about it rather than hate yourself for it because you, that just becomes a merciless um, script that you play out. That's the role you play. That's the role I played in my family. And it protected me from getting hurt more. You know, if I looked miserable enough, I wouldn't get attacked, right? So that's 
that that might be extreme, but we all have aspects of this where we, we think it's all our fault um, that there's pain in the world. It doesn't mean that we don't have accountability for our action. I don't mean that. But that the, the way that we learned when we were young to protect ourselves, uh, you can't start meditation practice and expect to go from wherever our defense system is. It could be that somebody's more arrogant. You know, the people who have an arrogant defense, that's just a protection, right? So we have to see that I'm not saying we all have this defense. We all have different defenses. Some people are know-it-alls. You know, that's how they protect themselves. It's like there's all the different ways we protect ourselves. But if you look at where you can go with it, you just drop into being vulnerable and not knowing what's going to happen next. And you develop all the skills of kindness or, or compassion for the self-hatred. It's just a protection. It's like a, if you love nature, just think of a, a turtle, turtle with all that armoring. You know, it's like the self-hatred is like the turtle shell. It's protecting that soft, sweet inside. I, I wonder, if, you know, the hard part with Zoom is you can't really tell if it's making, if it, I'm getting... <laughs> yes, uh, I think I'm still unmuted. Mandy. Yeah, can okay. you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, it really struck me when you said that, and I was thinking about it in relation to myself because I have a lot of self blame, especially around health issues that I have, in the sense that I'm not doing enough or I'm failing or I've done something to cause this, or, you know, so. Um, when you said that in your talk, I thought, whoa, <laughs> it was really sort of a powerful moment for me and made me think about in relation to impermanence, I kind of feel like it's a protection, a kind of weird twisted protection um, to avoid accepting the reality that actually I don't have control, right. like fundamentally. Right. Um, no, that's, that's beautiful. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So that was that's, kind of a big moment. That's right. That's the dropping into that vulnerability. It's un, and it requires understanding what you just said. It's beautiful. If you understand it, you don't need it. And but it's be, to be careful of, uh, you know, I always joke about the kind of most intense part of that is when you're thinking it's not okay, that it's not okay, and it's all my fault. You know, that's my favorite. <laughs> definition <laughs> you know because we we start thinking that we have this control and we should be we should have done this we could have done this you know we should uh it's and it's so exhausting and it's so painful yeah so good luck i i think that if i can do this you can do this <laughs> thank that's you that's what i think yeah <laughs> I think it's also important sometimes or for me or for many to to just remember, you know, like that the Buddha talked about conceit as, you know, one of these incredible, powerful, you know, toxins in the system. But that when the definition of conceit is any sense of being better than, worse than, or equal to, right? Which is different than our kind of normal, at least English language sort of framing of that word, I think. So this sense that like even worse than is a kind of conceit, even equal to the kind of conceit that you see that like we're up against, we have different flavors of it. And those flavors matter in terms of how we try to work with it for sure. But that this recognition just on that basic level as Michelle is saying and that you tuned into of like that, that that sense of meanness, a sense of, of solidity of self is a is a defense against the non-solidity of everything even if it's a negative solidity even if it's neg a negative self kind of projection it's at least it's me there's like there's a core there there's something solid and we know we hate it or we know we're just the best or whatever that spectrum is right and it's like that it's such a powerful it's such a fundamental response actually to the fact that everything is out of control and 
and subject to change and only arising and passing because of conditions, that it's, it's like the last thing to go. You know, the, the, in the, the framework of enlightenment, you know, there are these sort of stages of awakening. And it said that even a, even a person of the third stage, right, uh, like someone who has totally uprooted greed and hatred, they, like, to just try to imagine that even for a second, right? There's, there's no craving for anything and there's no uh, resistance to anything, right? That's pretty free. That even they still have these remnants of conceit of better than, worse than, or equal to, that doesn't get uprooted until you're uh, totally enlightened, like a fully enlightened arahant. So it's something, like, I just feel like it's important to recognize the degree of the subtlety and force of that tendency in us, and that it is possible to like totally unbind from it, but that it's gonna be a little while, and that we should like make friends with these patterns also, you know what I mean? Like most likely it'll be a while for most of us, you know? like. And in the sense of like, okay, we, if we have this idea that, wow, this arrogance or this self-hatred is actually something that's not going to just go away in the next retreat that we take or something, you know, it's like, this is, it is like the foundation of our defense against reality. And that's only gone when we don't feel like we need that defense. It's this friendliness, this tomo, this acceptance, this loving kindness, this like, oh god you must be scared there must be some threat there must be something that's like really terrifying or really hard right now and this is our way of of securing ourselves against it and can it be like an entry point into compassion and the tenderness and the feeling a little bit of care for yourself or if you can't feel it for yourself because it's self-hatred care for something because the care doesn't it doesn't matter where it's directed you're feeling it in the body in the mind and it does the work internally Thank you. Mm. Well, we probably have time for one more question if anyone has it, but we don't need to squeeze it out of you either. I have a question. Um, So my question that came up for me also during the retreat was, you know, when I'm aware of something like wanting or greed, wanting more, and I'm aware of it, I bring awareness to it, mindfulness to it, that that um, that that's a good thing, that that sort of counters the, the whatever the thought is, even if it's not a good thought, if I bring mindfulness to it. But but you're still not supposed to act on it, right? You know, what arises and it's not wholesome, you're supposed to practice restraint. So how do you work with it if if you don't have the strength to not act on it? Like for instance, greed around food and and I can be aware aware of the, it, the wanting and feel the wanting. But when I'm not on retreat, I don't have the strength of mindfulness to keep me from acting on it. And I don't want to be born in a hungry ghost realm. And um, so how do, how do I work with that? Upandita would advise he said when the, when the wandering or thinking or greedy mind or whatever is, is flowing very strongly, uh, you know, rather than fight it with aversion or um, actually we can remove the shoulds, should do this, we should have restraint. That doesn't, that's not helpful. That's just another judgment coming in. He said um, rather than fight it or, or think we should do this or that, to uh, allow our awareness, our mindfulness, to go along, to enter in, in that stream, that thought stream, whether it's greedy or, or fantasy or imagining or anger or fear, and, and, and just follow along. That the mindfulness then notices what your desire is focused on and what your desire is motivating you to do to reach for, you know, another bite or 
the bowl of ice cream or this or that. Just let your awareness, your mindfulness go along with it. Genuine restraint comes out of, um, not of rules, it comes out of wisdom. And wisdom comes from the stream, consecutive moments of mindfulness. You just keep going and just watch it and make it a, a, a subject of interest, of curiosity. Oh, wow, yeah. I want that. And I'm going to have it. But, but the only, which would you, what you ask of yourself is to do every moment of that with awareness. Not forgetfulness. Often greed cuts off that recollectedness that Michelle was talking about. So you pause, act, pause, act, and see where that takes you. Thank you. That's good. Remind me of so many retreat centers or places where they'll be like, you know, be mindful of how many, how much food you take in the food line, you know. And it's like they're not saying mindful; they're just saying don't take too much food. They're like, <laughs> not mindful actually. And I think that's like, like, like Steve's example. It's so important of like what actually is mindfulness isn't just self control. Mindfulness is mindfulness. It's like it's like being interested and trying to walk and trying to you know feel a sense of love exploring and, 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 and genuine interest. It's, it's great. Yeah. I, I could add one thing because I think this is such a fundamental human thing. Um, I remember your story about getting the chocolate. The chocolate, right. Well, it, I was going to just add that Usually we don't judge if we're eating like breakfast or lunch or dinner. I'm not sure if that's what you're referring to, but often we judge like eating that's coming out of um, snack, like a, like it's coming out of anxiety or greed. Or, And I, I do think, it, as and Steve are saying, but I just want to amplify it, that often um, I try to start with compassion for the emotion that's um, before the action. So if it's, um, for me, it's usually anxiety. I try to have, you know, compassion for that rather than judgment and connect, connect with that. And just um, if things are more stressful, I will tend to allow myself to eat more. <laughs> out of the anxiety and I if they're less stressful and I have more of a connection to the anxiety I don't eat as much but I don't feel like I have uh, I used that is one thing that feels like it healed more in me with with what Jesse and you know what Steve is saying that though if you're mindful of it there's not that added um, judgment about it that's so painful it's like um this Gadada saying, you know, we're doing that. We, you, were, you think you're doing it out of love. And so what I say is, well, just try to get in touch with the love before the action. And as Steve is saying, then see what happens. It's always experiment and see what happens and learn. That's what we're doing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Or don't learn. Or we don't learn and we get to try it again and again and again. <laughs> no problem. Good questions. Yeah. Well, thanks again for joining us, everyone. I know we, we had really glitches i know there was a we had our settings on to during the retreat we had, during you know it was into during the retreat zooms we would allow the yogis to um keep their microphones on so that we would at least have some shared like sort of soundscape um but anyway i know that, that cause a little problems in a, in a setting where we're trying to not have everyone enter with the mics on but we're getting the hang of it so thanks for hanging in with us uh with all the technology and um we do plan on being back next weekend and, and probably oh, quite a bit through, you know, July and August, but we'll just kind of keep it open every week and, and let you all know. 
It's lovely to see the mosaic yeah. of your faces. Yeah. Metta, metta, metta. <laughs> mudita, mudita, mudita. <laughs> 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 <laughs>